Thank you everyone for joining us on this Reproductive Management School video series. Uh, my name is Felipe Moriel. I'm an assistant professor at the IFAS Range Cattle Research and Education Center. And I'm also a member of the South Florida and Beef Program group, all right, that is providing to you this series of videos about uh, reproductive management, okay? So my presentation, what I would like to do is to focus on nutrition for reproduction. And uh, I, I'm aware that most people recognize that this, this, this topic here is very broad, right? It's, we should talk, we have a lot of things to talk about, protein supplementation, energy supplementation, uh, trace mineral supplementation, right? Uh, types of supplements, liquid versus dry, or pre-caving, post-caving supplementation. It's a very complex topic. I'll not be able to cover everything in about 30 minutes. But what I will do for this presentation is to show you what, in my opinion, is the best time for us to increase the body condition score of cows. What's the most economical way to increase, right? And that would also lead to an increase in performance of the cows in terms of pregnancy rates but also a performance of the calf. So I'm gonna show you some of the studies that we have been doing over the past three to four years that combines everything, right? Submentation so strategies to increase the performance of cows, but also the performance of the calves. So for this presentation, I'm only gonna focus on beef cows, right? Mature cows, which is first calf cows and multiplicous cows. And I will talk about replacement heifers in another video that I'll show you where it's gonna be available, okay? So, what I want to do is to show you first, what's the importance of body condition score and reproductive performance of those cows. And I'm gonna show you diff two different scenarios, a scenario of a person that does use astrosynchronization AI cows, and also another scenario where this person does not use this type of technology, but and only do a natural breeding. Okay, I'm gonna show you what's the importance of body condition score on reproductive uh, performance of cows in both situations using AI or not using AI. This slide that I want to show you is for first calf counts that are AI on the first day of the breeding season. Okay and here we can see a group of cows that calve in a high body condition score right of six or above on a scale of one to nine. Cows that calve in moderate body condition score around five, five and a half and cows that calve in a body condition score lower than five okay about four and a half or below. This is the number of cows in each of those groups, and this is the conception rate to the first AI. So one round of AI, what was the conception rate of those cows? Obviously, the, one, the ones that calved in good condition, they had greater conception rates compared to those that calved in poor body condition score. So just by this table here, we can see that we want our cows to calve on a body condition score five or above. That means here in this example that we had around 44 to 47% of those cows pregnant on the first day of the breeding season. And that's about almost 20% greater than those that have in body low body condition score. So you have more cows pregnant in the first AI on the first day of the breeding season. That means that those cows will have will calve sooner, okay, compared to those, this group here. And that means that the calf will be born, will be weaned at an older age and heavier as well, too. So you also harvesting a better performance on the calves just because they were more cows get pregnant on the first day of the breeding season. And that cow, these two cows here, because they calved, they conceived earlier, they're gonna calve earlier, that means they're also gonna have more time to recover before the next breeding season. What's interesting about this data here is that after the, the, the authors of, of, of this study, what they did, they broke down well, what happened to the reproductive performance of the cows if they gain, maintain, or lose body condition score after calving. Right? This is just a conception rate based on their body condition score at the time of calving. But what if they gain, if they maintain, or if they lost condition after calving? What happened to those counts? So what they saw here is not every count, uh, not, within each group, uh, we didn't have counts that gain, maintain, and lost. Okay? So for example, for the counts that have in high body condition score, we only have counts that either maintain or lost. Right? Because it's, really hard to make cows gain body condition score if they calve in high condition and they're only on pasture. Now for cows that calve in moderate body condition score, we had a group that gained, maintained, and lost. And for those that were in low body condition score, we have cows that gain or maintain, okay? And I know, and here you have the conception rate for each of those groups. 
what we can see here is that overall, okay, if you just summarize all of this data, what we wanted to do is to at least maintain or gain body condition score, and that will lead to high conception rates compared to those that lost. Something important that I want to show you is that it also depends on the body condition score at the time of caving, right? We want them to gain, to maintain or gain if they were in moderate or high body condition score. Now, if they cabin low body condition score, even though they gain condition after cabin, their conception rates was the lowest or was lower compared to any other of these groups here that cabin better condition. So what that table shows you is that we want to make sure that first they cabin good condition of at least five, five and a half, the better if they cabin at five, at six. And after that, you want them to at least maintain their body condition score and this will lead to the highest conception rates. Now, if they have in low body condition score and they gain after calving, but gain, gain condition after calving, that does help a little bit, those counts, but they do not fully compensate for the lack of attention before calving. So again, it's extremely important for first calf counts to calve in good condition and maintain after calving. Mature counts, they respond in a very similar way, right? Uh, those that have in better body condition score, they do have greater conception rates compared to those that have in low condition score at the time of AI. And if they gain or maintain uh, condition score after cavi, their conception rates is going to be better than those that lost. Although the difference uh, between those groups uh, for multiple counts is slightly less than compared to the first calf counts. But overall, regardless if a first calf count or if it's multiple counts, we want them to cap in good condition and at least maintain body condition score at, after cap. If they cap in low condition, you can try to make them gain and that will not be high enough compared to those that maintain body condition score and cap in great condition, all right? And this is for a scenario for someone that would like to try AI at the beginning of the burning season and then put bulls with those cows after that. But what if I don't want to do AI? Uh, and I just want to use bulls, which is the, what most of the producers do in Florida. Same, same scenario here, okay? The greater the body condition score at the time of cavity, the greater is the pregnancy rates of those animals. In fact, the impact is much greater than if you do AI on those cows. Because when we're trying to synchronize those cows and, and do AI, we can use protocols that help those cows resume masters uh, in, in scenarios that they would not, it would not happen if, if just because their condition is not adequate enough. Now, when you remove that extra synchronization from the, from the, from, from the management, and you're just relying on their the natural capacity of those counts to resume masters, the importance of body condition score at the time of Kevin it becomes even greater than when you use uh, uh, extra synchronization or, or AI to those counts. And you can see that the differences in pregnancy rates is much greater than this, the, the scenario that I showed you before, okay? This is final pregnancy rates of those counts. A body condition score not only affects how many cows will get pregnant, right? But also when this pregnancy is gonna occur. So cows that have in better body condition score, let's say five, six, or seven, they take less time to resume estrus compared to those that have in poorer body condition score. So you not only will have more cows pregnant, but it also means that more cows will get pregnant at the beginning of the breeding season, which is what we want. We want those cows to breed as early as possible, because that means they will calve as early as possible, and the cows will be older and heavier at the time of weaning, and that cow will have more time to recover before the next breeding season. So overall, these four uh, slides here, and I'm pretty sure that most people are already aware of this, the greater the body condition score of calving, the greater is the pregnancy rates, and the sooner it happens, regardless if you do an AI or if you just do with bulls. But I want to show you now an example, right? Economic scenario for discounts here. And I'm going to move this camera so it's not on the way. This is a table that was developed by Dr. Hurston, Dr. Thrift, and Yelich uh, several years ago. And this is a scenario where you would have in this ranch about 100 cows. And then you have cows that have in body condition score three, four, or five on a scale of one to nine. And here you have their pregnancy rates, weaning rates, the adjusted calf weaning weight, right? If you adjust uh, the weaning weights for calves as if they were, everybody was 205 days of age. And then here's weaning weight 
which is pounds of wean calf per cow exposed. All right. So what that means is this is the number of calves multiplied that were weaned multiplied by their weaning weights and then divided by the total number of cows that were exposed to the bulls. Okay. So how much pounds of wean calf have we produced per cow in this in this uh, example here, if the Kevin body condition score three, four, or five. And what we see is that the greater the body condition score, again, we have greater pregnancy rates. Also, we have greater weaning weights. And this is extremely important. We not only want them to get pregnant, but we also want to be weaning a live calf. Cows that have in low body condition score, it may happen to, to that those cows might be able to get pregnant. But those calves, when they're born, they have less vigor, so they're weaker at the time of birth. So you have a greater incidence of um, um, death rates on those calves just because they're weaker and they don't have enough immune system. Also, calves that are born from cows that have a lower body condition score, they will be weaner at the time, uh, lighter at the time of weaning. Okay, so when you calculate the pounds of weaned calf per cow exposed, we, you can see there's a significant increase on pounds of wean calf as we increase the body condition score in that cow. Now, what that does mean? What does that mean in terms of economic impact? I adjust this table using the most actual prices. This is about a dollar and thirty-five per calf, uh, per pound of calf. And this uh, video here was recorded in September, so here by the time of November, this number will probably not be accurate. But it gives you a good idea that even though I know that we want to increase body condition score of those cows so that they have more pregnant cows and we wean more calves, but that also means economically that we are going to have a greater return from those cows. So it does make sense to make sure that they calve around. It does pay off that these cows are going to calve in greater condition. They are going to return more money to the pockets of produce. So having said that, what is the best time for me to increase the body condition score of my cows and make sure they're gonna achieve an uh, optimal reproductive performance. So for that, we just need to look at their uh, nutrient requirements throughout the entire year, okay? So we can easily identify when we should do that. So in this scenario, I have a, a multiparous cow that's about 1,100 pounds and she's producing 20 pounds of milk uh, during the peak of the lactation, all right? The dash lines, are the blue dashed line is the protein requirements of these cows throughout the entire year and the orange line the orange dashed line I'm sorry is the energy requirements of these cows throughout the entire year and in this scenario I'm assuming that this calf will be weaned around May and the cow will calve around October and November okay and the solid blue line and the solid orange line is the protein and energy concentrations in Bahia grass that we would observe in average throughout the entire year. So what we can see here is that we have two periods. We have a period of deficiency and a period of surplus. Whereas surplus means that the amount of forage and the energy and protein concentration in the grass is greater than the requirements of those cows. So technically they don't need supplementation. And then there's a deficiency period that the requirements of this cow is so high that whatever we have on the grass is not enough to meet their requirements. So they are gonna lose weight. Something I wanna make you aware of and that not a lot of people uh, uh, know this, and we start to identify this issue once we start running more studies uh, at ONA with this type of cows, is that a period of deficiency can occur during the last 45 days of late gestation. So by 45 days before calving, even though we have plenty of grass in most scenarios, right, which is at the end of September, early October, the protein and energy concentration of that grass is slightly deficient uh, and slightly below the requirements of those cows. And I'm going to show you the impact that this minor difference has on the performance of the calves in the, in the subsequent slides, okay? But just by looking at these slides here, when would you decide to supplement those cows? Where would be the best time and most economical way to do it just by looking at their nutrient requirements. Obviously, it's right after weaning, right? Once we wean that calf, this cow is no longer lactating, her requirements decrease substantially. So this is the time that we want to supplement those cows to increase their body condition score. Even though their requirements is below what the grass is, a, a bit, uh, is providing to those cows, if we focus supplementation during this time here, 
we're going to be able to increase their body condition score with the least amount of supplementation. If I use, if I try to increase the body condition score of those cows during this time here, when they have the highest nutrient requirements in the entire year, the amount of supplementation that we're going to be, that we're going to have to provide to these cows is going to be so high that it's not going to be economically feasible. So even though the grass is providing a lot of protein, a lot of energy for these cows, this is the time to supplement. This is the time that we want to add supplementation and make sure they gain body condition score. So I'm gonna show you some examples so that you don't, you guys don't think I'm, I'm making this up, okay? So this is a table that shows the amount of supplementation for needed by a pregnant cow during the last one third of gestation. So the last three months of gestation, how much protein and energy supplementation or and supplement do I need to provide to these cows to achieve a body condition score of five at the time of calving, according to the forage nutrition value? Okay, so for example, let's say here I have a, a forage that is excellent. It has 13% crude protein, 52% energy. Now I have a group of cows that is body condition score three, five, and seven. The ones that are at three, I need to make them gain body condition score two points so that they would calve in a body condition score of five. This group here, we need, they, only, they are at five and I just want to feed them enough so that they will maintain this body condition score of five. And this group here, it's at a, currently at a body condition score of seven and I need them to feed them enough so that if they lose condition, they will not lose more than two points and they will calve in a body condition score of five, okay? So we had three groups of cows. Those that are three need to gain two points. Those that are five, we need to maintain. Those that are at seven, and they are allowed to lose no more than two. And this is the protein and energy requirements of each of these three groups of cows. Obviously, the ones that need to gain body condition score, they're gonna need much more protein and much more energy to achieve a body condition score of five. So in this scenario here that you have an excellent amount of forage, okay, you only need about one pound of corn for the cows that are in low condition score in order to make them gain two body condition score, uh, two, two body condition score units and calve at body condition score five, okay? So this scenario here, it's very unlikely we're gonna have at the end of summer or fall, but it could happen in early spring. That means that the forage is meeting most of the requirements of these cows. Now, obviously, if I decrease the quality of that grass, and now I have here a forage that we would classify as average or poor, okay? Average having 7.5% crude protein, 47% energy, and poor having 4% crude protein and 42% TDN. Now, obviously, the lower the nutrient uh, uh, value of this grass, the more supplementation I need to provide to those cows to make sure that they will achieve a body condition score five at the time of care. Okay, and this is just one example uh, that was done by Dr. Hurston in 2009, and just to serve to you as a reference, okay? Uh, obviously, it would be better if we work together and on an individual basis and we identify in your situation what would be the best supplement for you to use. But I'm also gonna show you here on this slide uh, another example for somebody that would like to use molasses and urea instead of cottonseed meal and corn. And you can see that molasses and urea, they have a little bit less energy than corn. So in that case, I would have to provide 1.3 pounds of molasses per day for these cows so that they would uh, uh, meet their protein and energy requirements in this example here, okay? 7.3 if they are on an average nutritional value for that forage. Now, this example here is that the one I would like to, to show you here and brought your attention to. Um, for a cow that is in very low body condition score and you have a very poor quality of grass, you will not be able to provide more than seven pounds of molasses with urea, all right? And you will have to complement that supplement amount with corn. And this, just an example, okay? We will have to complement with some, uh, uh, something else, but you will not be able to provide more than seven pounds of molasses and urea because the amount of sulfur in this case would be too high. And so we obviously don't want to run into this scenario where your cow is in a very low body condition score. She needs to gain a lot of condition. And we also have a very poor quality grass because that means that we're going to have to use a lot of supplementation 
which will not be economically feasible and you also will be limited on how much molasses and urea you can offer. And I also added one more example to you that instead of molasses and urea, you would like to use dry distillers games, right? But again, I'd like to show it to you that even with dry distillers grains, which also has a high concentration of sulfur, but not as high as molasses and urea, you would not be able to provide more than eight pounds per day because of the same issue. Too much sulfur in the diet and we want to avoid that, okay? So I hope that this uh, table here will serve only as a reference to you uh, so that you can see the point that I want to make that the lower the quality of the grass, the more supplement we're gonna to have to provide and there's all kinds of examples of supplements that we can do. Uh, we're not limited only to the ones that I just showed you. There's an infinite amount of supplementation uh, that can be developed. And, and then again, I would like to develop this supplementation progress on an individual basis with you, right? The other point that I want to show you is look at the amount of supplement that needs to be provided to those cows when they're pregnant and compare it to the amount of supplementation, same same kind of uh, example. But now, instead of a cow that is pregnant, I'm talking about a cow that is, has already calved, she's lactating and producing 14 pounds of milk. I showed you before that their requirements is much higher than before, right? Right after weaning, for example, when there's no uh, milk production. And look at the amount of supplementation that needs to be provided for these cows, according to the quality of the grass, compared to the previous, stage of the previous table that I showed you before. So the amount of supplement now that we need to make them uh, achieve uh, an acceptable body condition score at the time of breeding is two to five times greater than if I have done pre calving supplementation. So in this case here, very unlikely that it will be economically feasible. So again, it's much better to do it this time here, pre calving even though sometimes the forage meets the energy and protein requirements of those cows. But if you do need to make them gain condition score, this is the best time, because this is where you're going to need the lowest amount of supplementation during the entire year to increase a body condition score of those cows. You want to avoid having cows calving low condition and then having to make them gain after calving, because the amount of supplementation is just too high. And the first tables that I showed you before that if they calve in low condition, you can try to make them gain. It will not be economically feasible and it will not fully compensate for the mistake of having cows calve in low condition score. Right? So those tables, just these tables here should be enough, provide enough reasons to make sure that they calve in good condition. Let's make them calve good, body condition score five or six, and minimize as much as possible well, how much they're going to lose after that. But recently, Right? There's been a lot of studies focusing on uh, uh, this topic here called fetal program, which is the idea that by changing the nutrition of a cow during gestation, I can affect how the calf develops during gestation, and that will have an impact on their health after birth, as well as reproductive performance of the heifers and the carcass quality of the steers. Okay, so this, what I'm going to show you right now, should also provide you uh, enough reasons to make sure that they have adequate pre calving nutrition. That's the best time for us to do that because it's going to have an impact not only on the cows but also on the calves. And the reason that is two thirds of the calf growth during gestation happens during the last three months of gestation. Right? So if you have a cow, a calf that is born at 80, 80 pounds at the time of birth, around 60 pounds of that calf will be produced or generated during the last three months of gestation. During that time, we also had the formation of a lot of muscle fibers and adipose tissue, which is the tissue, uh, the fat cells that will be responsible for marbling, for example. So the late gestation period is one of the best times for us to act on those cows and improve their nutritional status to not only affect their reproductive performance, but also the calf performance, okay? So let me show you two studies that we have done over the past two to three years. And I'm going to show you some economic examples to show you, well, how much uh, pre calving supplementation can actually boost the income on, in your operation. Okay, so first, this study here, it was done uh, for two years. And we had the study started in August. And uh, those are all Brangus multiparous counts that 
started the study, we weaned the calf in July, we started the study in August, and they're all expected to calve in November, okay? So, but in August, we divide those cows in three groups. We have a group of cows that did not receive any pre-calving supplementation. A second group that received about 2.2 pounds of dried distiller's grains for the last 84 days of gestation, okay? And a third group that instead of providing 2.2 pounds for 84 days, I concentrated most of that supplement during the first half of the late gestation period. So I doubled the amount of supplement per day, but I cut the supplementation period by half. So the total amount of supplementation uh, offered to these cows during the pre-calving phase is exactly the same between those two groups. But the difference now is that I have half of the labor. And the idea is that, well, can I eat? By doing this, I'll be able to maybe achieve the same response. I increase the body condition score of cows, increase the pregnancy rates, increase weaning weights, but decrease labor by half, right? Then after calving, every single cow in this study received about four pounds of molasses and urea until the end of the breeding season. So the only difference between those three groups is if the, the, the type of pre-calving supplementation. Zero during the entire pre-calving season, to around two pounds for the entire late gestation or around four pounds for half of that time. Okay, so what happened to these counts? As I showed you before, this is the count body condition score throughout the entire study. We started the study in August. These counts came around November. We started the breeding season in January. Breeding season ended in April. So what you guys can see is that again, Obviously, the cows that received pre-calving supplementation, they gained more body condition score. So at the time of calving, they were close to one unit of body condition score higher compared to the control group, which is what exactly what we wanted. But we didn't see any differences if I supplemented two pounds for 84 days or four pounds only during the first half of that period. So that means that with half of the labor, I was able to achieve the same results. So which strategy would you use the one that supplements for 84 days, that you have to supplement those counts for 84 days, or would you do a strategy that allows you to reduce labor by half and you still achieve the same end result? Well, obviously I would like to do this one that cuts labor by half. Now look at the control group. Remember I showed you before that there is a period of surplus and deficiency in those counts throughout the entire year? and that during the last 45 days of gestation, those cows, they become slightly deficient. Now look at the cows that did not receive pre-calving supplementation. During the last 45 days of gestation, they start losing body condition score. It's just about a quarter or close to quarter or around half of a point, which is not that much, but still the forage itself was not enough to provide uh, enough nutrients for those cows during this last 45 days. And then after calving, everybody's treated exactly the same. What happened to the pregnancy rates of those cows in this study here? We did not see any differences. Right, so I told you before that we want to increase the body condition score of those cows at the time of calving, and this would increase pregnancy rates, and now I'm showing you an example that didn't. The reason that we had no differences here is, look more closely to the body condition score of the cows that did not receive pre-calving supplementation. They started the study at five, they gained half of a point during the first 45 days. They lost that half of a point until the time of carry, but they still kept in good body condition score, slightly above five. And they started breeding season at a body condition score of five. So these cows, they kept in good condition and they lost just half of a point. So the body condition score lost after carry was very minimal, which is what I told you before that that's what we wanted. So the benefit of pre calving supplementation uh, here in this scenario where you have cows that can in good condition was minimized right? because the control group did not need it. They were doing fine. Now, what happened to the calf performance? If I only look at the performance of the cows, you guys are probably saying that, so why did I spend money with pre-calving supplementation? It just didn't pay off. And then you're absolutely right. If you just look at pregnancy rates, it didn't pay off to, to add this pre-calving supplementation. But let's look at what happened to the calf performance. What we can see here is that calves that were born from cows that received supplementation, they were heavier at the time of birth. About two to three pounds heavier at the time of birth compared to those that did not receive pre-calving supplementation. 
And this is something that a lot of people ask us, and there are a lot of people are concerned, is that if you feed cows during the pre-calving phase, am I going to make these calves bigger and have problems with calving difficulty? And we have seen an increase in body in birth weights, like I said, two to three pounds, but it did not change the percentage of calves born alive. We had not had any problems with calving difficulty over the past four years that we've been doing two to three studies every single year. They do consistently uh, give birth to calves that are heavier, but it has not been a problem for us over the past four years, okay? At least using this amount of supplementation. What happened to the weaning weights of those calves? We weaned them at around nine months of age, and you can see here that the calves are born from cows that received the pre-calving supplementation. Both of those groups, they were heavier than the control group, which was born from cows that did not receive pre-calving supplementation. And the best results were for the calves that were born from cows that were supplemented for the entire late gestation period. So what that tell you is, I remember I showed you the results in, in cow body condition score, that the best strategy for the mom was the one that we supplemented only half of the time because I reduced labor by half and achieved the same body condition score at the time of calving compared to those that were supplemented for the entire legislation. But when I look at the performance of the calves, the best results were the ones that were born from cows that were supplemented for the entire period. So what that shows you is that the best supplementation for the mom sometimes is not the best supplementation strategy that will lead to the best results on the calf. So we have to look at both. We have to look at the performance of the mothers and the calves to determine which one is the best supplementation strategy to be used. Now, does it pay off, right? Let's put some numbers into it and let's see if these supplementation strategies pay off or not. So here we have first pre calving supplementation cost. It will be zero for those that did not receive any supplementation before calving, right? And for those that were supplemented for 84 days, we have about $5 per cow in, in labor. And plus 84 days of supplementation times 2.2 pounds of supplement per day, that's $200 a ton. That's about $23.50 per cow. Now those that were supplemented 42 days, the labor is cut in half. The total amount of supplement is exactly the same compared to the other group but their labor is about half, so that their total cost would be $21 per cow. So you're saving about $250 per cow uh, in this, uh, by doing this supplementation strategy here that instead of supplementing for 84 days, you just supplement for half of that time, but you double the amount of supplementation. But now what about the income? So let's assume that we have 100 cows, okay? And we'll use the pregnancy rates that I showed you before. So the cows that did not receive pre-calving supplementation, we have here 96% pregnant cows, times the weaning weights of those calves, times adult 37 per pound of calf, this is in September again, divided by the total amount of cows that were in that group. So what that means is that I'm returning um, um, uh, of income, $738 per cow exposed in that study. Now, if they were supplemented for the entire late gestation period, I also have 96% of pregnant cows, but now I have much heavier calves. So 591 compared to 561 times $1.37 divided by 100 cows, so that's a return of $777. If I use the other strategy, the one that supplemented for only 42 days, we had 88 pregnant cows, right? So we have a slightly uh, numerically lower percentage of pregnancy rates in this case here. Now the calves are gonna be heavier but when you do the total dollar per count exposed, it's gonna be less than the control. And the reason is because I have a numerically less number of pregnant cows in this study. Yes, the calves were heavier, but I have a little bit less calves born in this supplementation strategy. So what about the profit? So what do you do now is just subtract the supplementation cost by the income for each group. And then what you have is the best group were the ones that were supplemented for the entire latest station. You had the greatest return per count exposed. So even though I did not increase pregnancy rates in this case, just because we increased the weaning weights of those calves by around 30 pounds, that more than paid for the cost of pre-calving supplementation. So that shows you that pre-calving supplementation, even in a scenario that doesn't increase pregnancy rates of those cows, 
if it increases the weaning weights of the calves, that's enough to pay for, to cover for the costs of recalving supplementation and increase uh, your dollars uh, of income per cow exposed. Okay, and this is just considering for somebody that is selling the calf at the time of weaning. We do have results that I'm going to show you in other uh, presentations that these cans born from cows that receive supplementation, they also had greater carcass weight. So for somebody that is retaining ownership, you will harvest better quality of carcasses and a greater income at the time of slaughter if you do provide pre-calving supplementation to those cows. Okay, so again, the main point here is that even though we did not increase pregnancy rates of the cows, it was still enough. Uh, the, the heavier weaning weights of the calves was enough to cover for the cost of pre calving supplementation. Now I want to show you another supplementation strategy. And in this case here, we also added a feed additive called monensin, which a lot of you are aware of it. Okay. So in this uh, supplementation strategy here is very similar to the study that I showed you before. So we started the study about 70 days before calving. 160 Brangus cows, they all divided into several Bahia grass pastures. And then we had the three supplementation strategies. Uh, cows that did not receive any pre-calving supplementation, right, until the time of calving. Cows that received about two pounds of dry distiller's grains for the entire 70 days before calving. And a third group that we also offered two pounds of distiller's grains, but we also added 200 milligrams of monensin per cow per day. Monensin is a ionophore that changes the rumen environment. Uh, and what he does, he, he has a lot of studies showing that it, it causes physiological changes that improve the performance of the animals, right? They become more feed efficient, for example. And then after calving, all cows are treated exactly the same. Everybody received this molasses and urea without monensin supplementation, okay? So the only difference on, on nutrition of these groups here is how we fed them before calving, right? After calving, everybody treated exactly the same. So this is the dried deciduous grains that we used in this study. So let's look at their body condition score. Very similar to the study that I showed you before, okay, is that we started studying on a body condition score of five because uh, uh, most of the time at this time of the year, those cows are in good condition. And if we provided pre-calving supplementation, they calve in a much greater condition score compared to the control. Almost one unit higher compared to the control, okay? Now look at this again, on the last 35 to 40 days of the, the study, the cows that did not receive pre-calving supplementation, they start losing condition score again, about half of a point. But in this scenario, they lost enough that they calve in a low condition score. They calve lower than five. The previous study that I showed you, they gained condition during the first 40 days and they lost during the last 45 days, but they were still able to calve in a body condition score of five. In this scenario now, they were not able to do that, and they actually calve in a much lower condition score, about four, and a little bit higher than four and a half. So remember that those tables that I showed you, that when you calve in a lower condition score, lower than five, your reproductive performance is not optimal. So in this scenario, when I look at pregnancy rates, you guys can see here, sorry for the, the video, the camera, uh, cows that received pre calving supplementation, they had much greater pregnancy rates, about uh, 10 to 13 percent greater uh, pregnancy rates if they received pre calving supplementation. We did not see any benefit of the monensin, okay, but if they do receive supplementation before calving, they had greater pregnancy rates. And then the reason is because the control group calved in a much lower condition score and they started the breeding season lower than five. But what happened to the calf performance? So when we look at their weaning weights, right? Look at, for example, birth weights, calf body weight at the start, or the start of the breeding season, and the calf body weight at the time of weaning. Again, calves that are born from cows that received pre-calving supplementation, they were heavier at the time of weaning compared to the control. But if they were born from cows that were offered distiller's grains added with the monensin, they had the best results. Around, there was about 54 pounds greater at the time of weaning if they were born from cows that received supplementation added with the monensin. But if you don't, if you remove the monensin from the, from the supplement, you only provide dry distillers again, they were about 30 pounds heavier compared to the control. So again, 
calves that are born from cows that resist supplementation, they are heavier at the time of weaning. But in this scenario, I'm showing you that the pre calving supplementation increased not only the calf weights, but also the pregnancy rates of the cows. So let's look at the economic uh, analysis, that I brief, a very rough calculation for these cows to determine if paid off or not. So pre calving supplementation cost, of course, the ones that did not receive pre calving supplementation, it's zero. Labor cost for those that receive supplementation is going to be exactly the same because I'm providing those, that supplementation for the same amount of time. But here, for those that were added with the monensin, the cost of the supplementation is slightly higher. It costs you about three cents a day per count per day to add monensin into the supplements. Very, very low cost. So at the end of the, uh, the pre calving uh, period, the cost for those that were supplemented with the distillers grains is $22 a count. And if you add monensin to the supplement, it's going to cost you about $27. What about the income? Remember, now I have a scenario that I increased calf weights and pregnancy rates. So let's do the calculations, assuming that we have 100 cows in this range. So you have, out of the 100, only 82% pregnant, if they are born from those cows that do not receive pre calving supplementation, times weaning weight of those calves, times $1.37 divided by 100, so that's a, that means it's $601 per count exposed if they did not receive pre calving supplementation. But now I offer pre calving supplementation, increased pregnancy rates, so I have more pregnant counts, and I also increase the weaning weights. That means that in this group that received uh, the supplementation with the Steelers grains without the monensin, the income for, for each count exposed to the study is about $733. But if I added the monensin, I not only have greater pregnancy rates compared to the control, but also the heaviest group. So we have the greatest return of income, uh, uh, greatest income of all those three supplementation strategies. So now let's look at the profit. Let's deduct the supplementation cost from the income. And you guys will see that the best results were for the ones that the cows received the pre-calving supplementation and were added with the monensin. We are going to repeat this study one more time just to confirm these results. But what it shows you is that in a scenario that you increase uh, pregnancy rates and weaning weights, okay, we, we can have the greatest return if we do explore this uh, uh, strategy of adding monensin to the supplement. You do have to be aware that if you add monensin to the supplement, you cannot have horses around because horses cannot consume monensin, otherwise they will die. So, but if you are able to manage horses and keep them away from where the cows are and eating the supplements of those cows, this is a great supplementation strategy to do. But overall, what I'm going to show you with these two examples is that pre calving supplementation is a great strategy to increase the, pre the weaning weights of those calves, but also the, you might have the potential to increase the pregnancy rates of the cows too. And that's the time that we really want to focus on increasing conditions for the cows because that's when you're going to need the least amount of supplement. So pre calving supplementation here almost work as an insurance, right? Because if you don't need it, and let's say you have a great year, you have a year that has plenty of forage, the forage is a great quality, so technically you wouldn't need pre calving supplementation. In that scenario, using pre calving supplementation most likely will not increase pregnancy rates, just like I showed you in the first study. But we did increase weaning weights, and that was more than enough to cover for the cost of the supplementation and provide you an extra income. Okay, so again, I would like to work with you on an individual basis and we can develop this uh, supplementation strategy just for your program. What about replacement heifers? I do not have time to cover uh, this supplementation strategy uh, for this presentation. Okay, it's going to be just too much. But I want to invite you to watch uh, this presentation that Dr. Binelli and I did in October of 22nd, where we had, uh, when we had this uh, third nutrition for beef females. In this webinar, we had uh, about an hour presentation each, and we cover a lot about supplementation strategy for replacement heifers to achieve the best results, and also some of the reproductive uh, strategies that we can also implement in our range to increase the reproductive performance of those cows, okay? Mm -hmm. And it is available for free. It's just go in on YouTube and you search for the Ranch Cattle Research and Education Center channel 
and this video will be free for you to watch. Both of the presentations, okay, mine and Dr. Binelli. Okay, those presentations cover in details everything that I want to share with you. I also would like to invite you to look at our Facebook page uh, and look for the Ranch Cattle Research and Education Center. In that page, we have a chat that you can ask any questions and that question will be directed to the faculty that is a specialist in that area. And we also share a lot of uh, videos and webinars and, and photos and a lot of information about everybody's program. And I would also like to invite you to watch our online training on the importance of body condition score. It's a two-part video where we talk about the importance and also we train people on properly body condition score uh, angles. These are great tools for people that don't have a lot of experience on body condition scoring animals. You might have a family member, member that never, never done that before. You might have a, a new staff. Uh, or neighbor or somebody that is just started on the beef um, cattle business and they need a little bit more practice. These two videos are for free and they help a lot. Unfortunately, this entire year we have to do online training, so it's not as good as a hands-on or face-to-face -face training. But hopefully next year when uh, this pandemic is over, we will be able to have uh, hands-on trainings as we have conducted over the past uh, few years and you guys can fully enjoy this uh, great source of training that we have uh, developed over the past few years. So with that, I'd like to finish my presentation. If you guys have any questions about the things that I talked in this presentation or other questions related to nutrition, please send me an email uh, at pmoria at ufl.edu or you can call me at the center and they will uh, leave a message if we're not there or somebody will transfer the call to me and we'll be able to, to work it out. Okay, so I hope you, uh, that you guys enjoy the presentation. And again, if you have any questions, please contact me at this phone number or email. Okay, so thank you very much.